السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Can you hear me? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره I am very happy and grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being here with you uh, Last year we had some discussion with Sister Nasim about the possibility of having a retreat. They can't do it right now. They could before, but they can't. Yeah. Thank you. Can this become stronger? It's maximum. It's maximum, yeah. Uh, last year, we had discussion with Sister Nassim about the possibility of having a retreat. And I am very happy that it has materialized with the hard work of Lantern of Light team and your also readiness to take part. So that's great when the plans materialize. And inshallah, when we see the fruits, it becomes even better, inshallah. Uh, what I'm going to discuss uh, today is, as explained by the sister, about social velaya and uh, the way that uh, our sisters can prepare and contribute to the coming of Imam Mahdi Sharif. This topic is very, very dear to me, very, very special. And if I spend my life and just manage to establish this idea in the minds of Shia, I think that's great achievement for me. If I don't do anything else, just manage to establish this so that every Shia with the heart and mind understand this, then I think I have been successful in my life. Because this is so fundamental for our personal growth, community growth, and for the universal movement of Imam Mahdi Sharif that you can never overemphasize. Uh, I tell you a little bit history how I got to this kind of thinking. Uh, you may know that I used to be a deputy of international affairs of the Jamaat al Zahra in Qom, the you know, Islamic seminary for women. And we had a meeting <clears throat> that we had invited our uh, graduates, the sisters who had studied. Then they went back home to different countries. Then we had a meeting in home so that they come and, you know, exchange news and, you know, uh, maybe we give them a little more, you know, uh, ideas doing ziyarah of Lady Masuma, etc. So I was sitting in the meeting room and one of the invited speakers was speaking. And I was thinking about the significance of this meeting. I was thinking that it's amazing that some of the followers of Ahlul Bayt from different countries left their homes, maybe some of them for the first time. And you know, as a girl, it's not easy for families and for the girl, you know, to travel, you know, to another country. You don't know the language, you don't know the culture, you just know they are followers of Ahlul Bayt and you know, they are happy to receive you as students. But they made this decision 
they came, they studied a few years, then they went back home, they did, you know, some work, now they're back here, meeting again. So I was reflecting on the significance of this meeting. You know, many times we go through important things, but unfortunately we don't pay attention, you know, like, you know, our meeting today, this by itself is amazing that people from different cities, different backgrounds, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of, you know, having some spiritual time, some moment of reflection, meeting each other, they have come together. This is amazing. Uh, recently, alhamdulillah, I uh, managed to publish the book on Ziyara. And the first chapter, I have brought some copies, inshallah, I will show you. So, the first chapter is about ziyara of the believers, each other. Yeah, we are far from the shrines, but it doesn't mean that we are totally deprived. Just meeting each other for the sake of Allah is a great achievement. There are many hadiths that say, if you leave your home to visit a brother in faith or for sisters, a sister in faith, for the sake of Allah. It's not that you need something, you know, sometimes I need to go borrow something, give something, you know, as a personal need. But sometimes I just go because we are brothers or sisters in faith and we want to meet each other. There are many hadiths that say Allah will commission 70,000 angels to go with this person all the way reaching the home of the person that he wants to visit and then going back. So how many angels are now here? Each of you with 70,000 angels have come here. So imagine you know, what's happening here, but we are not able to see, but they see us and I am sure we benefit from their presence. And then in one hadith, the person asked Imam alayhi salam, what if it's a long journey? He was worried that maybe Allah, you know, goes, <laughs> runs out of short of, you know, angels. Because you know, if 70,000 angels are with this person and then another person, then what's going to happen if these journeys are taking long? Imam said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ جَوَادٌ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ كَثِيرُونَ Allah is very generous and angels are many. Don't worry. And he said, even if it is مَسِيرَةَ sana, even if this journey takes one year, I don't think there was any place in the world that could take you know, more than a year in that time. So, even if it takes one year, these angels will be with you. So, this is just for visiting believers. And amazing is what we have in several hadiths that Allah says, لَيْسَ إِيَّاهُ زَارَ إِيَّا يَزَارَنِي When you visit another movement for the sake of Allah, Allah says, you have not visited him only, you have visited me. You are a visitor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So, we have to reflect on these things. We have to appreciate every moment that we are together. And we have this blessing that we are visitors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It all depends on our niyyah. Yeah? Why we are here? If we are here for the sake of Allah, then we are visiting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are surrounded by the angels. So, we need to reflect. I was reflecting. The next day, I had to travel to Tanzania. And in Tanzania, there was a meeting for Muballighin in East Africa. They were gathered in Kibaha, you, you know, those who are from that region. So they asked me also to give a talk. And when I was preparing for that talk, the talk was not the next day. The next day I traveled, the talk maybe was in two, three days. When I was preparing, I started taking notes. And 
then finding very good points in Ziyarat Ashura, in Dua al in Dua Iftita, very happy, but it was new. And I said, either these people are going to appreciate a lot, or they are going to say this is you know, wrong. There was no middle way, because it was you know, very new. And I said, either they appreciate a lot, or they say, no, this is not acceptable. But I was convinced that this is good, I have to share, you know. And Alhamdulillah, it was very well received. And then one of the brothers, you know, one of, you know we had dinner with some Khoja brothers, in the evening told me, inshallah, you will see the result of this after 10 years. Anyway, I kept thinking about this, reflecting, teaching, sharing. Sometimes, you know, for example, in, I remember in Canada, one of the brothers who passed away, you know, a few years ago. He was taking me and my uh, family to Niagara Falls. I took the opportunity on the way, I talked about this issue, social reliance. And then he called his executive board and asked all of them to come in the night so that we talk about this. So anything, any opportunity I use to talk about social reliance, so if I manage to uh, spread this message in, and people accept, that's great achievement. Inshallah, all other good things will come after this, inshallah. So, this is a little bit background how this idea you know, came to my mind. Of course, there are lots of other things that contributed, but I just started from the last you know, bit of it. Briefly, the idea is that Vilaya is not a relation between every person and Imam alayhi salam and Ahlul Bayt and Rasulullah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separate from other people's relation with them. Wilaya is not just, you know, vertical. We normally think that Wilaya is my personal business. Yeah? Yes, I have to be kind to you. I have to, you know, help you. I have to be, you know, available for you if you need me. But that is something that helps me in my journey. My journey is personal. Yeah? Everyone has his own personal journey. Yes, in a sense, it's correct. Everyone has his own personal journey. But with this new outlook, we are all on the same journey and we are co-travelers. It's not that I leave home alone and reach here, you left your home, you reached here, we were independent. No, Velaya is a journey that in every step we are together. And in other words, inshallah, if it become clearer, that my relation with you and other believers is part of my relation with Imam Zaman, part of my relation with Ahlul Bayt. Is not something that I have to be careful about. It. Like for example, sometimes I say, you know, when you are driving, be careful about other drivers, respect their rights, etc. No, it's not like this. They are on the same bus, in the same car. They are with you. And there is no way to get closer to them unless you get closer to each other. Okay? So, this is the core of the idea. And inshallah, I will explain this. And I hope you can help in, inshallah, uh, accepting this mission and working on this mission so that, inshallah, our next generation will all have this kind of approach, this collective, you know, attitude to things. We are very much individualistic, unfortunately, and the modern culture is making it worse. But we have to go against the current. For us, community is family, yeah? But now, in the modern culture, even family is not family anymore, yeah? 
People are very much alone even in their own families. People are very much, you know, independent. Even if they are with parents or, you know, with a spouse or children, the concept of family is very much, unfortunately, under attack. But our understanding is that we are all one family. When it comes to a moment from even another part of the world, we should think we are one family. So we are going against the current to bring humanity back to the right track. Okay, so let us start with first explaining the concept of Vilaya. Vilaya is a concept which is very difficult to define. People cannot define it with one word or even one sentence. Sometimes people say, you know, Velaya means, you know, friendship, means, you know, for example, I don't know, leadership, followership. But in my humble opinion, Velaya means belonging to the same camp. Velaya means you have the same ideals the same mission, the same objectives in life. So you are part of the same camp, part of the same team. This is the meaning of Velaya. If you look at uh, the sermon of Qadir of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said, Allahumma man kuntu mawlah fa hadha aliyun Mawla. Then he said, Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man ada. Wakhdul man khadala. Wansul man nasara. Wakhdul man khadala. Whoever is adopting wilaya of Ali, you also be their wali. Okay? Whoever is helping Ali, you help them. Whoever is abandoning Ali, withdrawing help, you also do the same. What does it mean? It means that whoever joins the camp, above that camp, first is you, then me, then the next leader is going to be Ali. Whoever is going to be part of this camp, you accept them and help them. Whoever is going to refuse to join this camp and take the opposite direction. Because sometimes there are people who are not in the camp of the hat or truth, but they are not also in the camp of battle. They are in between. We don't believe that whoever is not with us is enemy. This is very wrong mentality. We believe there are two camps. But people are three groups. Some people are in the camp of Haq, some people are in the camp of Batil, and some people are Muzabzabin. Some people don't have a structured, organized, hierarchical camp to belong. They decide one day they are closer to this camp, one day they are closer to the other camp. They are just going, you know, right to left, left to right. And we should make sure that we reach out to these people, these people who are in between. Yeah? The greatest success is when you bring these people to the camp of Haq. Otherwise, the other party will take them to their side. So, there are people who are in the camp of Haq. There are people who are in the camp of Batil. In the camp of Haq, we have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have all the prophets and messengers. We have Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. In this time, we have Imam Zaman, Ajjalallah ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. In the camp of Batil, we have Iblis at the top. Then we have Fir'aun, we have Namrud. We have Abu Sufyan, we have Yazid, we have Muawiyah. And we have their likes today. Yeah? That is also another camp. And they are very organized. Yeah? 
they have obedience, they have leadership, they have great discipline. Sometimes their discipline might be even more than people in the camp of Haq. Yeah? Like people who were with Muawiyah, they were more obedient to Muawiyah than people in the camp of Amirul Mu'minin in general. Exceptions were there, but in general they were more obedient. So, this is why in Ayatul Wilaya, we say, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ بَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Okay, this is Ayatul Wilaya. What is the ayah after this? وَمَنْ يَتَبَلَّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Whoever adopts the wilayah of Allah and the Messenger and the, the believers, then Allah says, truly Hezbollah is successful, is victorious. It's a matter of Hezb, it's a matter of party, it's a matter of camp, it's a matter of being organized. Okay? Mu'manin are not supposed to be just bulk, in bulk, you know. We have, you know, millions of people, but they are not organized, they have no structure. Mu'mineen are supposed to be bunyanun marsus, like a very firm and strong building. If you have thousands of bricks, lots of beams, lots of, you know, plaster, cement, <laughs> sand, but they are not put together and they don't have a structure, what's the benefit? It's just going to, you know, occupy a space and, you know, make dirt. And you want to get rid of these things. If they are not put together, how long you are going to keep them? Yeah, sooner or later you say, no, at least I can, you know, get rid of the dirt and, you know, have the open space. But if you manage to bring a design and make these bricks, these, you know, <coughs> beams all part of a building, then you can enjoy, you can benefit, you can protect yourself. You can invite guests. Yeah? A community that everyone is deciding on his own is like bulk of bricks. Most of the year you don't see them. Then all of a sudden in Ramadan or Muharram they come like flood. You don't know what to do with this crowd. Where were you before? Yeah? Of course, we appreciate that they come in Ramadan on the month. But I'm saying, if we had even half the population, but throughout the year, it's better than, you know, having very little, then all of a sudden there is flood. If you have 20 people who are working together, it's better than 2,000 people who don't work together. Yeah? Everyone is deciding for his self, himself or herself. It doesn't work. So, it's a matter of being a party, a hezb, a camp. Now, in the camp of Batil, the relation needs two things. In the camp of Haq, it needs three things. Okay? In the camp of battle, they have ma'rifah and ta'ah. They know each other very well. They know where to get instruction, to whom they should answer. Yeah, they have obedience and they have ma'rifah. They know each other and they listen to the leadership. Okay? In the camp of Haq, Velaya has three elements. There is one thing more. Marifa is there. And inshallah we talk about Marifa. In the camp of Haq, Marifa is very important. Marifa of Allah, Marifa of the Prophet, Marifa of Imam of the time, Marifa of Mu'mineen and Mu'minat, we will talk about it, inshallah. Marifa is very important. Obedience is also very important. 
Yeah? If you want to remain in the camp, you have to listen to the leadership. But there is another element which is missing in the camp of Batil, and that is love. Love is there. What keeps the people in the same camp is love. What keeps people in the camp of Batil is not that they love each other. No, they are very selfish. They just hate the other camp. Hating the other camp keeps them together, but they don't love each other. As soon as they can, you know, get rid of someone and, you know, take the place of that person, they will do it. Quran says, Tahsabuhum jama. When you look at them, you think they are very united because they are organized, you know. They make one decision, all others follow. But, قلوبهم شتا تحسبهم جميعا وقلوبهم شتا But their hearts are divided. But when it comes to, you know, getting rid of an enemy, they are all together. Okay? So, there is no love. Quran says, on the day of judgment, all kinds of friendship turns to enmity. Except the pious people. Pious people, their friendship remains. Because they were really friends. Those who are not pious, those who are not virtuous, those who are not sincere, their friendship is superficial. Because with selfishness, you cannot be good friends. Yeah? They can just use each other. Yeah? They need someone for their comfort. Yeah? They want someone you know, to help them, but they are not really wishing the best for each other. A true friend never betrays you. A true friend never abandons you. A true friend never hesitates to tell your problems. He's happy to risk the friendship, but not leave you without advice. But the bad friend says, no, I don't want to lose this person. So let me just always praise him. Yeah? In the hadith says that a good friend is the one that sometimes may make you cry. And we have to appreciate. If, if a friend takes the risk of sharing something that is difficult for you, you have to know that this is a good friend. If someone is always flattering you and praising you, this person is not honest. So... All friendships become enmity except friendship among pious people. So, in the camp of Batil, there is no love. On the day of judgment, they become enemies. Okay? And Quran says very beautifully that the people who were followed in dunya, they would disassociate themselves from their followers. Those who were followed do bara'a of their followers. Pharaoh says to the people that he misguided in dunya, go away from me. I don't want to be with you. He does bara'a from them. It's not that he is loving them. And the people who follow them, also Quran says, now they do barah. They say, we wish we could go back to dunya and distance ourselves from them as they distance themselves from us now. They wish that there was a chance to go back and choose other leaders. But good people... They don't forget each other, they help each other, they do shafa for each other, they love each other, and they go together to heaven. Those people, they do bara'a, they go together to hell and hate each other. <laughs> they cannot separate each other, they have to be together, but they hate. Quran says, this ayah is, you know, very important, that yawma nad'u kulla unasin, the day we call every group of people to join their leaders. Imam 
means leader. Can be good imam, bad imam, yeah? We have imams that call towards fire. We have imams that call towards light. Okay? So, what is important is that every person has to join their imam. If they had imam in dunya, they have to join, good or bad. Those who followed bad leaders, they will take them to hell. Quran says, يَقْدُمُ قَوْمَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ It's about Fir'aun. يَقْدُمُ قَوْمَهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَأَوْرَدَهُمُ النَّارِ Fir'aun will lead his people to take them to fire. Leadership remains. Followership remains even if it is full of hatred. They want to distance, but they cannot distance themselves. But on the other hand, the, those who had good leaders, they will go together to heaven. Therefore, Imam Sadiq says, Inshallah, I will ask uh, Sister Nasim to share with you this paper. You can find also some references. Imam Sadiq says that when Allah calls people to join the leaders, we will join Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you will join us. And then he says, Where do you think you will be taken? If we are true followers of Ahlul Bayt, we will be behind Imams and behind Rasulullah. Where will you be taken? Then he said, Three times he said to Kaaba. Uh, sorry, to heaven by the Lord of Kaaba. Three times. Be because if you have followed them, you cannot go to any other place. You go with them. So, Quran says, everyone is resurrected as an individual. Okay? Initially, Quran says, Kullum. Please, you know, after this lecture, go back, reflect on these verses. You know, this is result of tens of years. I say it in few minutes, but don't just spend few minutes. <laughs> if you don't spend tens of years, at least spend, you know, tens of hours to get this ayah. Go back, check this ayah, put them together, do discussion. Because we need to make this part of our, you know, mindset. Every person first is resurrected as individual. Everyone comes as a fad, as an individual. Okay? Or You come as individuals. But then, we will call all people to assemble be behind their imams. Therefore, when they go to heaven or hell, they don't go as individuals. Those who go to heaven, they go in groups. Those who go to hell, they go in groups. Okay? So, it's like life in dunya. In dunya, everyone is born, but then they find their way, they join a camp, they spend their life in that camp. By the time they die, they are part of a camp. Unless they are confused, they don't know, you know which you know, camp to belong. On the day of judgment, first you are resurrected as an individual, but then you will find your imam, you will join your imam and the community of imam, and then you will go together for the rest of the journey. Okay? So, in Vilaya, which is the true Vilaya, the Vilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are three elements. Ma'rifah, Ta'a, Mahabba, knowing, obeying, and love. 
actually the reason for obedience is also love. Sometimes you obey out of fear because if you don't you know, obey, they will dismiss you. In order to remain in the camp, you have to obey the leadership. Otherwise, they get rid of you. Yeah? If you want to remain in the camp, you have to obey. If you want to go higher in the ladder, you have to show you know, full commitment. Yeah? But it can be all out of fear, out of selfishness. But in the camp of Haq, there is no fear. It's out of love. You obey to obey Allah, you listen to Allah, to Imam, to Rasulullah, out of love, not out of fear. Yeah? If Imam Zaman asks you to do something for me, he said, you know, can you do this for me? You are from this city? You say, yes, I'm from this city. He says, can you do this for me? What do you do? Do you say, you know, if I don't do this, I am committing a sin, so I have to do it, otherwise I will be punished? Or you would say, oh Allah, how can I be grateful that Imam Zaman has asked me to do something in my city? Yeah? You feel very grateful and say, you know, this is a privilege that I am able to do something for my Imam. Yeah? Everything should become like this. Our prayer, our fasting, our homes, everything should be like this, that we should do it out of love and we should thank Allah. I am thankful that you asked me to do this. Therefore, when we become baliq, we have to celebrate because that's the time that Allah has found me qualified to give me some instructions. Yeah, I have to be thankful that now I can fast, I can pray as a person who is trusted, entrusted with the responsibility. Before that is a practice. But now it's serious. So love is the reason for obedience. And therefore, they don't even wait for receiving instructions. I ask you a question and please refer to your heart. If someone that you love asks you something, you will do it. But if he doesn't ask you or she doesn't ask you, but you know that he or she wants this, what do you do? <coughs> you don't say, because didn't ask me, you know. I, for example, you know your mother needs you, okay? But she is worried about your work, you know, responsibilities. She doesn't say anything. But you know your mother needs you. So if there is any way to go and help her, you will do it out of love. You don't say, because she didn't tell me, then I don't need to go. If she had told me, then, you know, it was difficult to say no. Now I have to go. No, you do it out of love. Or when you know, for example, your father is thirsty, in the middle of night, for example, your father is your home, okay? And he's coughing, but he doesn't want to awaken you. He's guest, but he's coughing. What do you do? You say, unless he you know, asks me for water, I just enjoy my sleeping. Or you say, no, I should now go and offer water. So, mu'minin should not wait for instructions to come. Mu'mineen should always think what my Imam right now wants from me. And I should do it. Especially in the time of Ghaibah. Some people, you know, have this mentality that if Imam Zaman asks me for something, I will do it. Definitely. But this is not the right time for this kind of attitude because Imam is not going to ask you. You have to be of that level of understanding that you can know what a man wants. Therefore, in Dua Ahd, what do you say? In Dua Ahd, we have two similar but very different sentences. One is we say to Allah, please include us among al mumtathalina le awamirah Those who implement his commands. Okay? Al-Mumtathalina la 
But there is something which is even better. as ila iradati. Those who proceed in doing his will, not just his command. Do you understand the difference? Awamir is command, something which is issued. Irada is in the heart. I should know what is in the heart of Imam and then proceed, even don't wait for others. If I know Imam wants this, I should say, I should you know, do it very quickly. I should have this opportunity of doing something for my Imam. Two different levels. One is wait for a command to come and then follow. The other is to be able to understand what Imam wants. Maybe you say, how can I understand what Imam wants? When he's not you know, talking to me, when he's not sending a message to me, how can I understand? That is ma'rifah. That is ma'rifah of Imam. Yeah? If uh, I say this sentence, uh, and it's very, you know, uh, serious sentence. If me and you don't know what Imam Mahdi wants from us today, we are not good Shia. If we need a steel after 14 centuries, Imam Mahdi directly speak to us so that we know what he wants, means we have not understood our faith, we have not understood Ahlul Bayt, we have not learned the examples that Ahlul Bayt have given us in their lives. When you live with someone for a few years, even if you are not very clever, after a few years you know what that person thinks. Yeah? Those who are very intelligent in a few days, if you have a friend for a few days, you travel together, you can understand what this person wants or doesn't want. If you are not very clever after a few years, what about 1400 years? If with all the time that we have spent with Ahlul Bayt and their scholarship and their teachings and you know, reviewed again and again, if we don't know what Imam wants, we have problem. There is amazing, this is my last point because inshallah we will have a break for salah. There is amazing hadith from Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam says to a person called Abu Khalid from city of Kabul. Abu Khalid al Kabuli, okay, from Afghanistan today. Imam says, those who are waiting for Imam Mahdi and believe in his Imam, afdalu ahli kull zaman. They are the best people of all times. A good Shia today is better than a good Shia in the time of presence of Imams. In general, the way, you know, there are always exceptions. You know, we cannot be like Salman or Abu Zar, you know, like, although we can be, but we don't expect that. But generally speaking, our generation can be better than the generations that existed in the time of Prophet and Imams. Why? Why Imam says, Afzalu ahli kulli zaman. They are better than people of any time. Le'anna Allah. Because Allah the Almighty, Aatahu, min al-uqoole wal afhaam wal ma'rafah, ma sarat bihi al-ghaybatu indahum bi manzilat al-mushahada. Because Allah has given them so much of understanding and intelligence and intellect that for them ghayba and mushahada are the same whether they see imam and listen to imam or the imam is in occultation it doesn't make difference if you have a you know class of students that when you are in the class 
they are very careful, you know, quiet, they do things. But as soon as you go five minutes out, they start fighting. It's not a good class. A good class is that whether you are in the class or not, they know what they are supposed to do. When you leave other classrooms, they don't realize that you are not in the room. A bad class is that if you are away, everyone in the school understands that this teacher is away. We should act in the way that no one thinks that we don't have Imam. Because we have our system, we have our, you know, a structure, we have our understanding. We know what Imam wants from us. Okay? So, Ma'rifah. Ta'a and Mahabba. But the order is like this. Ma'rifa leads to Mahabba. Mahabba leads to Ta'a. Out of love you obey. Okay? There is no selfishness here. You so much love Imam and so much love the community of Imam that then you are happy to do whatever you can. Out of pleasure, out of joy. Okay, inshallah, we continue, bismillah, after break. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen.